you this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, moving on. Remember what we've been talking about now. We've talked about um, he's trying to get us to be imitators of God in chapter 5. Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus saying we need to be imitators. You need to do this. You need to do that. He's talking about husbands and wives, wives submitting to husbands, husbands loving the wife as Christ loved the church, which is an un, uh, un, uh, conditional love that was given in that fashion. And so you see all this taking place here. Now he's going to move to in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to move into uh, children obeying parents, right? And uh, why they should do this, how they should do this. And so you're going to see that in this chapter today, we're moving into the whole family unit. Uh, you need to understand something about this too before we even get here. Is what the family unit was going through in the first century church. What was happening in Rome, for instance? A good example of this is this. Uh, most families were in shambles. A little history of what took place here. Mutual love among family members was almost unheard of. A father's love for his children would have been even hard to imagine. By the Roman law of Patria Potestas, a father had virtual life and death power, not only over his slaves, but over his entire household. He could cast any of them out of his house, sell them as slaves, or even kill them and be accountable to no one. A newborn child was placed at his father's feet to determine his fate. If the father picked it up, the child was allowed to stay in the home. If the father walked away, it was simply disposed of, much as aborted babies are done in our own day. Discarded infants, now get this, who were healthy and vigorous, were collected and taken each night into the town forum, where they would be picked up by strangers and raised to be slaves or prostitutes. So you think things are bad today? Guess what? There's nothing new under the sun, is there? This is first century church Rome government. This is the way a Roman father run, run his family or ruined his family, if you will. Trust me on something here, folks. This doesn't sit well with God. He will not allow a government or a people or an individual to last very long doing this kind of stuff to children. You need to understand that. And, and I look at even us here in America today, I think, boy, have we got an answer for some blood, right? Have we got an answer for some things we've been doing to children and allowing to happen to children? God does not allow it. The Roman government, wasn't long after that, they come all to pieces, right? Nothing long after that, every nation, every generation of people that turn away from God and run away from him do all kinds of evil. At one point, somewhere along the way, their evil's going to come to an end because God says it will stop somewhere along the way. Just like the sin of the Amorites had to reach a certain point before God says, all right, judge them. Let's do it. Let's do it. So look with me in Ephesians chapter 6 here, what Paul's saying to the church at Ephesus. He says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, we're going to stop right there and just use these first four verses. First verse, the first word that jumps out to you, this whole thing, is about what? Obedience, isn't it? Being obedient. Now, there's a promise that goes along with that. As a matter of fact, this verse comes from uh, Deuteronomy 5, 16, and, and Exodus, the talking about the Ten Commandments. It is the only commandment that's laid up with a promise behind it, Right? And that promise is that you will live long in, the, in Deuteronomy and Exodus is talking to the children of Israel saying, if you do this, you'll live long in the land I have given you, right? Paul takes it and brings it into another step and says, if you do this, you'll live long. You'll just live long life. You'll have a joyful, long life in the Lord. Now, I, you understand something here now. I realize there's a lot of lost people that live a long time, Right? There's a lot of Christians that live a long time that did not obey their parents. Bottom line. Why? How does that happen? Mercy, right? Grace, absolutely, right? But if we follow this rule, if we follow what God is setting up here, as, even as children, and look, we're not, we've all failed and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no doubt about that. But if you, as a child, if you obeyed, if you, if you did these things that the Bible tells us to do, then there was peace in the family, first of all. I, that's one thing I noticed first and foremost about children who obey their parents. The family's at peace. There's not a lot of turmoil going on in that family, right? 
And if the father, if the husband's loving the wife and the wife is respecting the husband, all that, there's a lot of peace in those households. Amen? What's the opposite of that, though? What happens in the household that doesn't put God first, that puts themselves first, has selfishness going on? Fight galore, right? Big time. All the way through this life, fighting and carrying on. He says obey. The word obey itself means to submit to, comply with, to hearken, to heed, to follow. It, it's, it's, it's a word, in the Greek word means there's no substitute for it. You follow that parent as a child. And, and I look, I realize many of you got grandkids now. Same thing, right? You're pouring yourself into that grandchild. You'll pour yourself into them when they come visit or when they come stay with you or whatever. And you're pouring God into them, bottom line. Amen? You're a believer. God dwells within you. You're a believer. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. That child needs to see God in you. Not just a grandparent. Not just a kinfolk. But Almighty God himself. Right? And we do that. So this, doesn't, this still applies to us. Even though we may be grandparenting along, kicking along here, and don't have children that we're raising right now, the thing is we still pour ourselves into those children. We pour God into them. Being obedient to that is the first choice, the first thing that God says here in these words in, this, in the Scripture. Obey your parents in the Lord. Why? Look what is behind that. For this is right. There's an absolute right there, folks. It's not up for, uh, uh, you know, let me consider it or let me no it's right in the Lord there's an absolute right and wrong right <laughs> obeying parents obeying our parents was absolutely right in the Lord let me tell you something this not only can apply to Christian children in a Christian household this can apply to, apply to, pay, apply to the pagan child too that he is to obey, obey his parent too why because it is right it's the right thing to do you see, there's a lot of people in this world, probably a lot of people right here in Central, that do the right thing, but they're still not following God. They know how to do the morally right, the, the right thing to do, but they still don't have God as the center of their life. Something else is, baseball, football, whatever, you know, sports, whatever, is the center of their life, but yet they're raising morally good children, and they behave fairly well, right, as most children will, right? And they, they're doing all the right things, because this is actually right in God's sight that children obey their parents it's not it's not an option and it's it's explained to us in such a way that it's just outright right to do now, i don't know how you were with your children all children are going to disobey all of them are going to have a rebellious spirit about them somewhere along the way we call them the terrible twos right where they're trying to find out who they are type thing <laughs> you know how that works uh they'll push that envelope and kick down the door if they can to just to prove who they are type thing and try to find out where their boundaries are that's all a two-year-old's trying to do find out where my boundaries are and let me tell you something folks if you don't give him any he's going to take everything and get his hands on right He's not going to have any control whatsoever over his own thinking process or his own greed. He's going to grab everything he can. We're going to get into that here in just a minute about how we raise our kids. Did we raise them close to right or did we way, way off a of base of what we did with them? And even some of their grandkids we're dealing with now. How are we doing that? So we see that this, this first thing is to obey the Lord. There's a limit to a child's obedience. Does that mean that child's obey that parent? If that parent is abusing that child, beating that child, sexually molesting that child, is that child supposed to bow down to that parent all the time and obey that parent? No. I'm just going to go right out and say it right here. God, the, the key part of this verse is in the Lord. In the Lord has no place for that kind of abuse of a child. No place whatsoever for anything of abusive, sexual, mental, whatever kind of abuse may be thrown on that child. That is not God. And this Bible is not telling that child to remain under that. I know sometimes they can't escape, can't get away. But I'm telling you right now, in this country, we have gotten so lax on this thing that we're just allowing it. It's, it's starting to come wide out in the open of child abuse and trafficking and all this kind of stuff going on. And we're just like, oh, well, not my child. Who cares, right? We better care, America. We better care of what's going on with children. No doubt. It's interesting that God says even in his word in Mark 9, he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to be thrown in the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. There's judgment coming for those who do that to children. It is going to be horrible judgment coming for those who do that kind of stuff to children, who do that in, with children and two children, abusing them, yeah, absolutely not. The phrase in the Lord is the key word there. It's the key word. And remember, as these, these verses are being written, 
it's being written to believing parents, believing children, church people, bottom line, right? That's who he's writing to. He's not writing about the heathen out there. He's writing about Christian church people. He's taught, that's why he talked about husband and wives right before this. In the Christian household, this is what it should look like, right? In the Christian life, you back it up in chapter 5, this is the way you should look. This is the way you should walk. This is the way you should show Christ to the whole world. He started out with the individual, went to the couple, now he's with the children. Saying, this is the ideal way this is supposed to look. You know, it's interesting that in new parents say, boy, there's no manual on how to raise these children. Yeah, it is. Right here. <laughs> We've had it all along. It's been, been available for 2,000-something years for us, right? It's right here how to raise children, how to be a parent, how to do... You can't leave God out of the equation or it's impossible. We need to understand that. It's impossible to raise godly children without God in the household. It's impossible. Want to know what's wrong with this country today? Leaving God out. Number one, foremost, in the family. Amen. Then in the schools, then wherever else you want to take him out of. You, you don't bring God into these kids' lives. You end up with what we see today on the TV. A child who doesn't know how to take no for an answer. Grown kids, I'm talking about 40 and 50 years old, don't know how to take no for an answer. They never have had to accept no. They were raised not under godly principles. And so the, the, we end up dealing with this. We end up putting them in jail. We end up doing whatever or letting them out, whatever. But point being is that obedience is the first and foremost part here. The whole creation of this world started with obedience. God spoke it and it happened. You never saw the stars arguing with God about, I don't want to shine today. You know, it did it, right? <laughs> they obeyed. Even the stars and all of creation obeyed God's voice. And Adam and Eve obeyed God's voice. Created for re relationship with him, obeyed, heard his voice, created for that. Then came the fall. That was the first disobedience that messed it all up, didn't it? Bottom line. And we're living under that even today. We still live under that fall. We still live under that that, that, that has not been reconciled to God yet. He sets us free. He saves us, amen? And he sets us free from that fall and from that sin and teaches us how to live above it and over it and not be indulged in it even today in that walk. But obedience is what started the whole thing in the first place. It's striking here to promote something that it, children are not told to obey the parents because it pleases the parents. What does it say? In the Lord pleases God. When children obey the parent and grandchildren obey the grandparent right on down the line, right? When we respect those in authority over us. That child is to walk close to the Lord and that his mind is constantly upon the Lord. If he's saved, he's raised in a godly household, God's going to be in the conversation sometime along the way every day. Every day. Now, and you can look back on your own childhood, look back on mine. Mine wasn't like that. God, by his grace and mercy, still called me, Right? But my household was not, we didn't talk about God like that. We might have cursed him, but we didn't talk about him in a, you know, a clean manner. Let's put it that way, right? That was never brought. Dad didn't lead us in the spiritual realm of things in the household. He taught us and basically held us to the fire of living like he was brought up. <laughs> That's interesting enough, which is one way to provoke your children if you're not careful, right? Of living the way, now it's good enough for me, it's going to be good enough for you, boy. Get out there and do it, you know. And he taught us how to work, yes, that was a good thing. But trying to keep us in his generation was frustrating, right? Because we're not that generation. Have you noticed that about your kids? They didn't want to live in your generation. They didn't want to live with what you had. They didn't want to hear stories about what you didn't have. They didn't want to hear stories about going uphill in the snow both ways, walking to school, right? No, we didn't want to hear any of that where the panthers are screaming in the woods. Woo, that, who, you know, that's not my life, Dad. My life is I get on the motorcycle and ride to school. Yours wasn't like that. Let me live mine, right? And trust me, there's something about that not holding down a generation to make them obey, obey and do exactly what you did. But when it comes to immorality, unlawfulness, that's when you put your foot in, right? That's when you put your foot down about it. Say, no, child, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. That's against God's way, it's against lawfulness, it's against this. But let them, <laughs> let them be the children that God's going to make them be, eh? And that's, that's hard to do sometimes, realize that, but... We're not to obey the, those parents if it, because it pleases the parents, but because it pleases the Lord. And Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. There it is again. It pleases God. Proverbs 10.1 says, The Proverbs of Solomon, A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. And then it gave two different pa parents here. 
it brings grief to mom for a foolish child, for a disobedient child. And hey, I've seen it time and time again, even in youth work back in the day when I did youth ministry and stuff. I saw what a foolish child did to a household. <laughs> it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. Mama's always worried, and Daddy's always in grieving about something. What is wrong with that kid? What is wrong? Why won't that kid do this? That just brings about chaos. It brings about chaos. And trust me, it's, if Satan's going to tear a family apart, that's the first thing he attacks, isn't it? The, the structure. He attacks the, the, the children. And he attacks he did just to bring it all down. Bring it all down. Attack from inside that to break it apart. Secondly, it shows in that verse, says, parents, obey your parents for this is right. And then the second part of that verse 2, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Honor your father and mother. Now, we need to understand something about this. I was still, I'm just using myself as an example. My mom visited here in 2012, I believe it was, and she came here because I wouldn't go home. But no, she's up here to see her baby. I'm 50 years old, I'm still what? The baby, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? In her mind, she sees a 50-year-old man, but she still sees 1958, a baby, right? My last little baby. <laughs> That's the way it was, friend. That's the way it was from there on. Now, something changed in the way they treated me once I became about 25 years old. It wasn't, you had to do what I say or whatever. It was more like, okay, you know, I say around 25, probably around 22. You're, you're now becoming a man, out of the nest you go. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's time to grow up, Right. There was a different way they treated, a different way they talked to me, a different way they reacted to things to me. They didn't rule, you might say, with an iron fist. They said, let me suggest, you know, as a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, the older I got, the smarter they got. Y'all been there, done that, right? Seemed like the older we got, man, them jokers were smart. And the older I got, the more I realized my granddaddy Andrew, whom I'm certainly I named after, my granddaddy Andrew only had like a third grade education. That joker was smart, though. Right, third grade, he, he did logging and cattle running. He, he was an old cowboy. He, but when I look back on his life and his wisdom he had, he didn't get that out of a classroom. He got that out of life. And that man was smart. I was like, whoa, he only had third grade. I, sh I should be way smarter than him, right? And not in some things I wasn't, right? Not everybody's a rocket scientist, right? But you get, the older we get, we seem to understand, man, mother and daddy's right about that. Back when they were telling us that, when we were 16 and 17, we were like, you know, you're too square. You don't know what you're talking about, right? You don't know life. I got life. Woohoo! here we go, right? Didn't work out very well, too. But we honor those parents. So that, that, this is not talking about just children in the home. This is talking about grown children. This is talking about me and you. If we got our parents still alive today, trust me, we'd honor them, wouldn't we? We'd honor them. All the way to the day my dad died, I never talked back to him. Even though I'm a grown guy, 50 years, whatever, years old, 40 something, I never looked at him and said, hey, old man, let me tell you what it is. You know, I know, I knew if he could get up out of the chair, he'd whack me. You know, <laughs> it was just the way it was. But that wasn't the fear of him getting up and whacking me. The deal was I now honored him because I'm a grown adult too, and I honored him. And all the teachings he taught, right or wrong, I still honored for who he was, my dad, my father. Mother, same way. All the way up until the day she passed, never sassed her. You better not. I sassed her once as a teenager and liked to get killed. But, yeah, you never, you don't sass mama just because you're now 50 years old and she's 80. So you don't sass her just because you got the upper hand and you're stronger. You don't sass her because why? You honor her, right? And if you're fortunate enough to and you still live in the same city with mom and dad all the way till they die, you get to help them through that. You get to be there. I couldn't be there. My sister was for mom all the way to the day she dies, but I, I'm four or five hours away. I couldn't get there every day. You know, it's one of those things. But you honor by doing and taking care of, too, all the way to that moment when they cross over. That's what that's talking about, bringing honor. You, 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 you obey, but you honor the father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? That it's going to be well with your, that you go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Now, I've said before, there's some people that have not honored parents, and they still live a long life on earth. I think it's just God's grace and God's mercy. There's Christian people that did not honor mom and dad, but they're still living a long time on this earth by God's grace, God's mercy. But there's some that are living today and, and enjoying life still in their old age because of this very thing right here, what this verse says. God said, I promise it's going to happen. This is what will happen, and I will, I will be with you and, and help you through all these things. 
So we honor them that way. There's two promises to children that honor their parents. First things that will go well for them, as you see in verse 3. And then we're assured of a long life, that we, things will go well and have a long life. And then he goes on to say, look, parents, he turns it back. Now the word fathers here can be actually in Hebrews 11, it's actually the same word, Greek word for parents, or both of you, in other words. But for some reason, other Paul leans heavy on the fathers here. As he writes this in, he changes direction and says, dads. And why do you think he's going toward the dads on this situation? We're the spiritual leaders of the family. We are the head of the household, aren't we? Whether we want to be or not, God set that order up. So Paul is bringing it back around to say, fathers, don't what? Exasperate your children. Y'all ever been exasperated before? Me too. Right? I'm going to show you some ideas of what, and then you're going to go, oh, yeah, that happened to me. Oh, yeah, 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 that happened to me. Right? I got exasperated before. Parents, don't exasperate your children to wrath. He says right here, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the tra uh, training and the instruction of the Lord. Now, again, he's talking to Christian households here. Pagans are not going to do this. They're not going to bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. They're not going to bring them up in instruction of the Lord. They're going to bring them up in the instruction of psychology and the best way they know how to live life. If they want them to be thieves, they're going to teach them how to pick pockets. Right? If they want them to be robbers, uh, they're going to teach them how to shoot a gun and be a robber. Whatever. But they're going to teach them the way they know where they are. Now, as Christian parents, we're to what? First and foremost, before we teach them the ways of the wisdom of the world, we teach them God first. Because God trumps all that, right? God's ways and God's uh, rules here and regulation and his ways of living will take care of all the world's wisdom. As a matter of fact, the scripture does say something about the world's wisdom is actually foolishness to God, isn't it? I mean, think about our world wisdom we've been living under in the last three years. <laughs> it's been wonderful, hasn't it? Major ignorance, right? I mean, think about that. The world's wisdom that throws it all out there. It's brought about some major ignorance, and people just follow along like good old sheep do, right? Think about that. They're running away from, they are leaders of our country, running away from God's wisdom, running away from God's instruction, and throwing out the best they can do. Well, let me tell you something about the best man can do. It still stinks, right? Our righteousness is what? Like filthy rag in the sight of God. His righteousness of Jesus Christ upon us, pure and clean, washes whiter than snow, right? That's what God sees on the Christians. So we need to understand something here. We're not to exasperate our children or agitate them, if you will. The word exasperation means to arouse to wrath or anger, to provoke to the point of utter ex exasperation and resentment. There's two significant discussions here. The first four things, uh, four things that will provoke a child. Failing to accept the fact that things do change. Time and generations do change. That's what I mentioned just a moment ago real quickly. Dad trying to raise us in his generation mindset and not letting us be the generation of 1970 or 1965 or whatever. Now that's not to say you let the child go and just run rampant and be you know, rebellious and, uh, to law and lawless and all that kind of and rebellious to God. No, you keep them reined in on that, but you let them be themselves. I have found that in my, from my generation to our children's generation, Chelsea, that age group, I didn't allow them to run like wild animals, right? But I let down on some of the reins of the way I was raised up. Because if I hadn't let down them reins, I guarantee you she'd have kicked against the wall. Knowing Chelsea, I mean, she's probably going to see this online and go, Dad, don't use me as an example. But anyway, the uh, point being is if I'd have put, we'd put too many walls around her and said, you are not doing this, guess what's the first thing she's going to do? I think both of my kids would have been that way. But Laurie was smarter than I was about that stuff because I'd raised a different way and Laurie's raised a different way. Laurie's like, let's let, the, let the, the, the gate open a little bit and see if they'll just obey us. And if, if we can let the gate open and not put them in the fence we were raised in, let's see how they act, how they work. And of course, she had the psychology degree. I just did music. I didn't know. But anyway, she worked on that with us. And it, and it worked, folks. It worked in a way of it built, taught them how to do trust. Now, I'm not saying my kids are perfect. Trust me, we've heard some stories since they've grown up. Like, what in the world will y'all do? But it built trust in them kids. It built trust in us. And it was an interesting thing because I'd have never, my parents would have never raised me that way. Mine were like, here's your wall. You better not touch it. You know, don't you dare go outside. Don't you do, don't you do. You know, and it was built around 
just morality more than Baptist thinking, too. It was just that type of thing. Don't you dare do this. You get a whooping if you do this, you know. But with ours, Laurie says, let's open the gate. Don't treat them like we were raised up. It's another generation. And it was built upon trust. And they knew, they knew, if you ever break this trust and lie to us about anything, the gate closes. <laughs> Can I tell you that worked? It worked. And to this day, more to their mom than to me, they can talk about anything in the world, and there's no judgment on what happened or what did, you know, took place. It's more like, oh, wow, you know, and we're hearing about it now, what took place or what. And it's like that communication was wide open the whole time with both of them. And I even coached Whitney in basketball and got rough with her a few times, but still had communication open about dad. That sucks, whatever, you know, something like that. It didn't send us over the wall if they disagreed. Because the next generation is always going to disagree with the previous generation. Didn't you do the same with your parent? Didn't you say, you know, that dude was raised up in the 40s. He don't understand what the 70s are all about. He doesn't understand about life, right? Yeah, he did. Like I said, the older I got, the smarter that joker was too. He knew. And our kids... You were raised up in the 60s and 70s, Dad. You don't know about the 80s and 90s. I'm like, okay, better heed my word on this one, right? I'm going to let you make that mistake, but I'm telling you, the heater is hot. Don't touch it, right? <laughs> I mean, y'all have told a two-year-old that, and he touched it anyway, right? Every time, every time. I don't believe you. Ah, scream bloody murder, right? Yeah, they got to find out. They got to find out where that envelope is. They got to find out where that edge is, if you will. Now, interestingly enough, we still do the same thing as grown-ups messing with sin. We want to know where the edge is. We want to know how close we can get to it before we get burnt, right? And many times we get burnt before we realize we got too close, before we got too close. So, failing the fact to recognize the generations. Don't allow rebellion. Don't allow immorality. Don't allow injustice. Correct those things, but let them be who they are. Even with your grandkids. You're two generations off from them. Even with them. Let them go, but, not, but just to a point. Over-controlling a child will also exasperate a child. How many of y'all ever been over? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Over-controlled. Yeah, yeah. Got too many boundaries. Got too much stuff going. Too much discipline. Too hard. Too rash a discipline. And, and that, that discipline just keeps you crushed down. I have, I have seen this time and time, especially in college when I was in school, that kids would come to school and go absolutely crazy wild at a Baptist university. You know Why? Because they were raised up in that strict Baptist mindset that had all these fences built around them and they couldn't express themselves. So when they got away from mom and daddy, guess what? Expression is on. I mean, it was crazy too. I mean, you're not supposed to smell marijuana in the hallway of a Baptist college, are you? Oh, yeah, we did too. Phew, that stuff stinks too. Anyway, at night, Friday nights, yeah, good old Baptist kids, right? They were expressing themselves when they got out from under that oppression, if you will, or that too much discipline over their life. Many of them were preachers' kids. That's what was surprising about it. They're the wildest bunch of all, right? These kids getting away from their daddy who's had a thumb on them all their life, and then boom, they take off. But you know what? It's interesting to watch them, though, because as crazy as they were, eventually they came back to their roots, came back to what was taught them about the Bible. They might have went crazy nuts rebellion, but they came back to it. Raise up a child in the way he should go, and what? When he's old, he'll return back to it, won't he, Right? That's scriptural. That's Bible. Raise him up in the, in the Lord, and he's going to return back to the Lord eventually. It's just going to take a little time. Take a little time. Over-controlling to do that. It must be balance. Can't be too hard on Can't be too soft on there's a There's a central balance there that is, that is uh, available. Over-control. The opposite of that be under-controlling a child can exasperate a child. Now, I was raised up... Well, I'm going to make a two-part series out of it. I was raised up with a kid that was my age whose parents did not discipline him. Can I tell you he was a holy terror? This is the same one. He's, they'll never see this because they're all dead and gone now. This is the same one that when my dad was trying to correct him on something over at my house, he turns and calls him a whatever and flips him off and rides off on his bicycle. Did I tell you dad was just about had his belt halfway off wanting to whoop that kid? If you ever want to whoop somebody else's kid, yeah, me too, right? <laughs> yeah, let me, get a, let me have five minutes with that little sucker. I'll fit. Yeah, because he, he, this kid had no discipline in his life. Parents let him run crazy wild. He was the youngest of his family too, same age as me.
Can I tell you what happened with that kid? He didn't turn out very good. He sure didn't. By the time we hit 10th grade, a teacher was trying to discipline him. Get him down to the office. He ran back and popped him right in the mouth. Decked him right there in the hallway, 10th grade. Never came back to school again. Totally dropped out. Who do I blame for that? Not that boy. His mom and daddy. Didn't raise him in the Lord. Didn't raise him right. Raised him around. Let that child run free. Let his spirit be itself. Let him, uh, let him rule the roost. Well, he ended up didn't last long. As a matter of fact, what this scripture says right here is a good example of his life. Honor your parents and obey them. That way your life will be long upon this earth. He didn't make it past 20, y'all. He shot himself. He, got, he killed himself. Could not put up with life anymore. Too much freedom? Absolutely. No rule, no regulation, no envelope to kick against? Absolutely. He had all kinds of freedom. And he hated it. It exasperated his soul, exasperated his spirit. It made him angry at everything. Everything. And I watched that young man as we went through school together. He's one of my good friends as a kid, little baby, you know, 10-year-olds or whatever. And I watched him raised up that way, and I watched how I was raised up with fences and borders and parentheses around my life and parents who would whip me and care about what doing right and wrong and his who didn't. And trust me, his life, was I wouldn't want to trade it for the world because it ended up driving him to an early death, driving him to an unhappy life and then death. He was even in trouble with police. Long, and I'm going to talk about a little old town where everybody knows everybody's business type thing. He's involved with police from the ninth grade up to the day he's dead. His older brother was on the police force, having to go and arrest his own brother because he's doing something stupid. The older brother had a pretty decent life. I don't know. He was raised different for some reason or another on the police force. Got to the point, he said, I am not going to arrest my little brother anymore. He wasn't very little by that time. I don't send me out to get my little brother off of somebody again. I am not going to do it because it causes turmoil in that family too. You think that family wasn't in turmoil a lot? Oh, yeah. Because the family wasn't built around God. I've seen it firsthand. Lived right close to it. Not even a quarter mile from my house is where they live. In that same little country neighborhood. Trouble. Trouble. And I look at that. That's back in the 70s, folks. I look at that life, and I look at where we are today. Can I tell you right now, the people we're having the most trouble with and are being the most ridiculous today had that kind of parenting. It's, it's that they're lost. It's that they had no good guidance in their life is what we're dealing with today that is going to absolutely ruin the country, Right? And hey, some of them are elected officials. Some of them are elected officials. They're still children. They're still rebelling in their heart. They still hate mom and dad. And it's showing up. It's showing up. I'm going to have to stop right in here. I didn't mean to throw this down like a downer on it, but we just need to wake up and realize where this comes from. Where we are today in this country and how we got there, it didn't happen overnight. It's been a 70-year slow burn, hadn't it? I say 70 years, that'd be back in the 50s, maybe even in the 40s, maybe right after World War II it started. I don't know, but it's been a slow burn. It's like having a frog, putting him in a cool water in a kettle, turning the fire on. What happens? He stays in it. His body adjusts as the water gets hotter and hotter, warmer and warmer. Finally, it just boils him, kills him. That's America. We turn the water on, we all jumped in the pot, and we're thinking, oh, it's just a sauna feels fine. Let them express themselves. It's fine. It's fine. Went through the 60s, right? It's fine. Let them, oh, let them do that. Ain't going to hurt them. Went through the 80s if it's all about me, me, me. And yeah, it's fine. Let them express themselves. In the 60s, you had people like Dr. Spock writing books about never whip a child. You're going to break his spirit. Oh, my goodness. Spare that rod. You're going to spoil that child, right? That scripture goes right against his philo philosophy of life. It absolutely did. And we see what's happening today. I can tell you the main root cause of what's happening today is we threw God out. He's out of the family. He's out of the government. He's out of people's lives. He's out of the school. He's out of everything. You can't mention him anymore, right? 
Well, let me tell you something. God doesn't smile on a country that throws him away like that and that abuses kids and that allows things to go on that are just horrendously wrong and ignore it and spends the last 50 some odd years killing babies. Nothing new under the sun. That's why I read that story at the very beginning. The Romans were doing the same thing. They were doing the same thing to kids already born out of the womb, young children, and deciding, I don't want them in the house anymore. They're a pain. Let's put them out in the forum and let some stranger take them and put them in prostitution or whatever they want to do with them. I just don't want these kids anymore. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, starting to sound like America, isn't it? We need to repent. We need to be careful. Be careful. Nothing better turn or judgment is coming upon this nation. Get ready. I was talking with someone the other day. I said, you know what? We may not even be raptured before we see all that judgment take place upon this nation. Ouch. We may see it with our own eyes. Lord, I hope not. But if we do, we do. And if we repent, it won't. If this nation turns back to God, it won't. It won't happen. It won't happen. That judgment will not come. I'm going to pray for you guys and let you go. The music made the world go round. That's the way to be happy. This much I found. Sing the song. You'll be happy and free. Turn around you and follow me. But I have a soul that's weary and warm. But I've heard.